Okay. Um, I do love the questions. Good. That's that is that's good to hear. Um, you know, again, they're, they're just a goddess, man. But uh, you know, let's let's go with it. I'm going to move some things around on my screen because I I think the first one was a good place to start. All right. So let's just get in it, man. So, Neil, before I even really get into the questions, um, who is Neil? Tell us about you. Uh, well, you know, again, my name is Neil Richardson. Uh, I wear many hats like a lot of folks do. Uh, my day job is Director of Continuing Education at the University of the District of Columbia um, in Washington, D.C. Now, I've been there for about eight years and uh, uh, worked for uh, two or three mayors in the past doing strategic planning and policy development for the, for the mayors. So that's one hat. Uh, but then the other, the other hats I wear is I'm a soccer player. I'm a dad. Um, I love hanging out with my friends. I love traveling. I've been traveling. I've gone to 50 or 60 countries. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, and I like to meditate. And I guess we're going to talk a little bit about that, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the Old Souls, what I call it, the Old Souls interviews, man. And so I'm excited just to explore some of your life. And I think that for the most part, all of these interviews really come out of an inspiration of just being curious about people and being curious about people's journeys. And so that being said, what interests you most about life at this moment? Well, definitely my son, Kai. Um, he's a miracle of the universe. He's four years old. <laughs> you do wow. the math, you know, uh, he was uh, a beautiful surprise. So that's definitely one of my big interests, um, right. and my overriding interest. But I, I, I released a book last year that I co-wrote with Rick Smyer called Pre Preparing for a World That Doesn't Exist Yet. Mm. And um, it's been really exciting getting the book out there and getting uh, ideas that I co-created not only with Rick, but with a whole bunch of different people who helped us create the ideas. But um, I've actually learned about the book that I wrote from other people. It's been amazing the insights that people have. They'll read the same chapter that I wrote and they'll come back to me and it's like, I hadn't even thought about that. Wow. So it's been, it's been uh, really fantastic doing that. But um, the book is creating some opportunities for me to do some writing, uh, a lot more writing, uh, teaching. I um, te taught a class related to the book over at Georgetown University last spring, and I hope to make that a regular gig. We're in sort of talks about that right now. Um, yeah, I'm doing a class uh, that appears with Ubiquity, um, which obviously how you and I met. Um, and I think, you know, eventually what I see in my kind of long-term, probably near-term future, is want to create a, more opportunities to just write, teach, um, spend even more time in my meditation, you know, my insight practice, and... Uh, probably take a step back out of my University of the District of Columbia job and do um, be a little bit more footloose and fancy free, maybe. <laughs> nice. Well, we, we will talk more about your book um, as we go through the interview, but I, I, I do have a question. Since, since you started the book or, or since the book has been published, um, are there any things that you're seeing in particular that that has maybe taken steps forward to prepare us for the future or that you're seeing things that you wrote about um, that you're seeing, you know, the world maybe as a country or just a global, global world? Do you see any steps moving forward to get us prepared for the future, so to speak? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the, a lot of the context to the book uh, I've been working on for about 10 years. Uh, but one of the things that uh, we sensed, Rick Meyer and I and all the folks in our Communities of the Future Network, was that uh, we we're going to be going through a devolution of government. Mm. Uh, 
were going to want to become more involved because they, in one aspect, they kind of lost sense and faith in, the, in their government. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. You restore that, and the way you fix that is you allow people in, you know, with transparent, you know, using uh, transparency, um, getting people involved. And we've got a whole chapter in the book called um, uh, Multi Collaborative Democracy. Mm-hmm. It's part of a movement called Polycentric Democracy that this guy, uh, Eric Liu, and Nick Hanauer uh, developed uh, four or five years ago. We're kind of part of a movement bringing, creating processes to bring people into policy making. And I've, I've done a lot of practicing in this, you know, in here in Washington, D.C., since about 2001, I've been able to try out a lot of the ideas. And we were able to move a, a, a city government that was probably one of the worst in the country, mm-hmm. bankrupt, federal government had come and take, taken us over. Uh, and we elected a new mayor who created this incredible process where people helped us decide where we're going to spend the entire uh, allowable budget uh, that, is, that the city had to spend. About 40% of the budget is already dedicated to like police, fire, things like that. But mm-hmm. the other part of the budget was discretionary we basically threw it out there and spent a day talking to residents on how to do that. um, DC has gone through a Renaissance the last five or, you know, five or six years. And I, I uh, uh, attribute a lot of the Renaissance to the, to the planning exercises and the way we incorporated people into the decision-making process. So that was one way uh, that the book, um, uh, was kind of prescient, you know, about how um, people were relating to their government, you know, mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. and I think, you know, right now we don't, you know, we've got a complete loss of faith and trust in a lot of, particularly a lot of our elected leaders. I think all of our institutions um, are under a lot of pressure, and I think that we're going to have to change the way we're doing things. So there, some that comes out in the book um, quite a bit. So are you? You know, all that I'd say I'm I'm really hopeful though about the future and about a lot of the seeds and weak signals that I'm that I'm sensing out there. Excellent. Now, as you talk about, um, and I'm I'm really interested in in the process that you develop with the is polycentric. Could you say that for me one more time? Polycentric democracy. Polycentric democracy. You said this was something you developed over 10 years ago, or you started in 2001, is that correct? Uh, yeah, we started, um, so in two, so it, in 2001, in, actually in the year 2000, we started a strategic planning process in DC, um, where again, we were gonna get people more and more um, involved in it, but we didn't call it polycentric democracy. That was a concept that uh, two other thinkers came up with, uh, again, Nick uh, Hanauer and, and Eric Lee. Um, they did a great book that came out four or five years ago called The Gardens of Democracy. So that was the first time I'd ever seen like the word. Um, but uh, what it basically means, it's an organic way to, uh, to run your government. You run decision making and policy making. And it's less about coordinating and creating these like hardcore systems, you know, people go to vote, you know, and need a policy teams to come pull things together. Right. It's much more organic um, where you try to react to, uh, you know, what I call weak signals, things that you see coming down the track and you start getting government to be a little bit less reactive and more proactive, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in, in seeing things. But polycentric democracy basically is a lot more organic and it's bottoms up as well as top down, but it really creates this in, in a way that's never been done before um, anywhere. It creates a way to get the public in like major decision making. Mm, mm, mm. You know, as 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 you talk about this development, I mean, I, I guess in terms of changes in policies and different ways to approach uh, politics and, and governance, it's relatively new, but I mean, you know, we're talking almost 20 years now, it sounds like since this has been in development. Um, but when we think about, at least what I'm thinking about is emergence, you know, the new emergence that's happening in the opportunities for um, 
strategies such as the polycentric democracy to really arise in the midst of the chaos that we're seeing, especially I mean, yeah. in the United States. But I mean, mm -hmm. we're starting to see several different movements and several different, um, I don't even know what to call them right now, <laughs> complexities yeah. that are arising, you know, with the the France, uh, the France um, election that recently took place was seeing some of the same kinds of rhetoric that was used uh, during the campaign, uh, the yeah. latest campaign in the States. Yeah. Sounds like there's some other different countries who are also feeling these same kinds of uh, tensions. And so from a global hyper complexity perspective, yeah. it sounds like these are great opportunities for things like this to arise and to um, be given an opportunity. It's really kind of interesting that, you know, there's obvious, obviously uh, here in the United States and in most of the developed world, particularly in the West, uh, there's, obviously, there's obviously a polarity. You know, there's people, you know, you know more conservative, more um, liberal or progressive. But there's the commonality that both constituencies feel and see uh, is uh, they want government to change and adapt. It's not responsive to them. You know, and they, you know, in large segments, don't trust the government, and they want to become involved. And so, I, I gave a I gave a talk to um, a group two weeks ago that was sort of half, you know, half on Capitol Hill, half Republicans and half Democrats, and probably a good portion of independents in there too. But you know, the thing that everybody could come to agreement on is that you know, um, government worked well for about 240, 250 years here. <laughs> um, but we've got to allow it to change a little bit right. and, um, and adapt, you know, because um, it clearly didn't work well in 2016 in this past election. And it quite frankly has been working well for a long time. And we've been kind mm -hmm. of ignoring it, hoping that something was going to, you know, fix it by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to take some intention. And some of the ideas that we talk about around po in polycentric democracy and a particular tool that we have called uh, multi-collaborative governance um, is a way to do that. Wow, wow. You know, when you talk about the devolution, you know, what, what does that, how does that look? What do you think that that would look like, let's say in the next five years, we, we can start there, start there. I think that, uh, I think that, that both the uh, the DNC and the RNC, the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee, are feeling a lot of pressure um, about how they've how they've how they've how they've run their uh, decision making processes. And I think that both Democrats and Republicans seem to generally feel like uh, the choices they've been given aren't working. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a populist movement in both both the Democrat and in both the right and the left um, in, in both um, committees. I think we're going to see a lot more people not necessarily like Bernie Sanders, but we're going to see them on both parties. I mean, the, the Republicans, there's probably four or five different kinds of Republicans, and there's probably three or four major kind, you know, kinds of, of Democrats, you know, anything from sort of statist um, politicians all the way down to populists. Mm -hmm. And I think that the heart and soul of each of the parties is going to be fought over, you know, over the next four years, and particularly the midterm elections um, and what transpires and happens there. Mm. I think that's when it's going to go into overdrive. Mm. You know, I think marginal things are going to happen between now and the midterms, and we're, those are going to start emerging now as, as the parties pick their candidates. Um, but particularly in the Democrats uh, on the side, where they have a number of uh, senators up for election, uh, an amazing amount that they could possibly, uh, you know, depending on what the polls are saying and how accurate they are, I mean, they could lose 12 more Senate seats mm. unless they pick wow. the candidates that people um, connect with. Um, and considering the frustration and a lot of the tension that you know, that a lot of people have, particularly on the, you know, on the, on the Democratic side about the, where the nation's going and who's in the White House, um, you know, the health care bill, you know, what we're doing with international treaties and, you know, climate change. Um, 
the Democrats can't take anything for granted and they've got to, you know, they're going to have to create a party that lets some more people in and that doesn't dictate who is going to run and you're just supposed to vote for us because we're not a Republican. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, man, that, there's, there's definitely a, a lot there, man, that, that deserves attention and can go into many directions, man. As I think about, um, heck, I was going to say three or four years ago, and I'm just thinking about the time, the last time I was in the States just two years ago, but yeah. still having such a high, a high representation of Republicans in the House and in the Senate and how we're seeing, um, at least how I saw the results of, um, we'll just say hindrances in policy, <laughs> policies yeah. being yeah. made. So, but you know, as, as, as I've had some conversations about, you know, coming back to, to the book of preparing for a future that, that doesn't exist, Is that, did I say it correctly? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, preparing for a world that doesn't exist yet. Preparing for a world that doesn't exist yet. Um, I think I shared some of this with you in a in a Facebook exchange. Um, Juan, actually, uh, my coworker and I would have conversations about this uh, because we served uh, high school students, and our population was first generation college students and low income. And so we, we always had these, these kinds of conversations about uh, youth and how the education system really wasn't, I mean, it was very stagnant in terms of growing with the students. And so the, the conversation about preparing for a world that doesn't exist, preparing for a future that doesn't exist would always come up. But something that sparked out of that conversation was the ideas of children biologically having the key, if you will, to the future. And what I mean by that is, um, as we we think about, there was a, a research that came up probably about five or six years ago that at that time, young adults, 25 and younger, that their brains were much larger in the pleasure seeking parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I've, as I've thought about that, at least at that time, um, if kids and young adults are, if their brains are already shifting in a way, um, but our traditional systems have not shifted with that what what does that mean for how we need to prepare for that? And, and what does that mean in terms of um, adaptations and really just throwing things out and saying, okay, we really have to refocus how we provide a service and we educate these youth. Mm-hmm. Um, coming back to you being a father of a four-year-old, are you seeing any kinds of indications of the keys of the future, so to speak, on how to approach education, how to approach teaching him life. And as we talk about the devolutions and we talk about the future things happening, are there any any kind of indications of awakenings that you're having to say, you know, wait a minute, maybe I need to re reapproach or recalibrate how I approach yeah. how I'm teaching my son. I don't know if the, all that makes sense, but I'll give it to you, then we'll go from there. Yeah, well, we've got a whole chapter in the book um, on uh, higher education mm-hmm. and how it's got to change. And well, not just higher education, but K through 12, um, you know, up to pretty much K through 16, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. But we've been doing it wrong for a long time. You know, when, when the university system started, you know, more or less four or 500 years ago in Scotland and in Glasgow, um, one, of the, one of the first ones, you know, it was rote learning, you know, and you had people that are particularly coming for, to learn uh, religious doctrine. Um, and at the time, of course, they felt like everything was completely certain. And so you could tell people, you could sit with a, uh, you know, you could have a room full of sitting students, you know, staring up at the, you know, at the, at the minister, um, telling them, you know, exactly how things were. Mm-hmm. Well, 
doing the same, we're still doing the same kind of teaching today. Mm -hmm. We still got this, this sage on the stage, you know, this yeah. teacher in front of the room, he's, you know, he or she's the, you know, the expert. Um, and the students are supposed to write down and record, you know, all the smart thoughts that this person's sharing. Um, unfortunately, there's all kinds of problems for that. Number one, uh, only about 10% of the population actually learns well in a, in a sort of static uh, learning environment um, uh, at best, which means about 90% of students uh, aren't learning all that they, they can be. And so what we focus on in our book is number one, individualized learning, uh, mm -hmm. where we believe that uh, most students need to be engaged one-on-one -on -one, uh, to figure out where they are. So they almost have to have an individual assessment to find out you know, using an Enneagram or some other kind of you know, personality assessment to figure out how best do they learn. Mm -hmm. um, and then we put them in, in, in groups or teams in classrooms. And so there'll be you know, anywhere from four to six uh, students and they'll work together because Education in the past was because things were happening really slowly. Um, you could go to the library and things hadn't changed, you know, up until about 50 years ago, things hadn't changed as much, you know, as far as how we understood history and facts. I and mean, of course, everything's changed since then. But until about 50, 60 years ago, you could go to the library and, you know, you could kind of, you know, you know, uh, uh, find out what you needed to do. Well, things are much more fast paced and interdependent and connected now. And, no one can know all of American history, you know, and, uh, and as now we understand history is very contextual. Uh, but again, our, our parents, and our grandparents, history was usually taught in one or, you know, maybe two ways, you know, if you went to a really good school or had some, had some good teachers. Now we know that there are as many histories um, <laughs> as there are methods, uh, you know, to the, to the narrative, to the story you want to tell. And so the way that we learn um, is we have to pull students together uh, so they can share what they're co-learning and teachers are going from being more from an expert to a facilitative person mm -hmm. helps them connect the dots and help you know helps guide them on where they can get um, factual information and so um, you know while I'm working at the you know at the University of the District of Columbia I'm actually based out of and helped uh, launch the community, the first community college here in DC. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and uh, so my, my passion uh, is probably more than anything in community college because they're placed all throughout, you know, communities all throughout states uh, where it sort of hits the grassroots, you know, that bottoms up thing, you know, that I, that, that I really uh, relate to. And so we're working um, in six or seven community colleges just from the class to facilitate learning. Okay, so we're having some slight internet interruption so hopefully things will pan out and we don't have to stop the interview and restart it really we're really excited to uh you know you know be able to do that and the network is got five or six other colleges that are getting ready to join the network but we've got uh you know we've got you know three or four that are really deep in it another one that's you know again kind of like that. Uh, working maybe more okay what's the an opportunity to do that Neil, it, my internet has been dropping for the past like three minutes. So I missed yeah. a great chunk of what you were talking about. <laughs> That's all right. Did, did, you, did you notice any freezes or any, any drop? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you disappeared and then your name, then just your name was there. It came up. Uh, 
but your but your your beautiful face disappeared. <laughs> well, I'm back now, so appreciate it, appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, what I was hearing the last the last I heard was um, you starting community the first community the community college in D.C. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And that your passion of I'm going to assume that you have a passion of, I didn't catch that last part. You had a passion of something. <laughs> got a real, you know, I've got a real passion for community colleges because they're placed all around in states and communities where it engages pe people that are, um, uh, in a lot of ways, wouldn't have another opportunity to go to college. Um, and uh, I think, you know, uh, if we're really going to transform the country and get people back involved in the political process, back involved in thinking about the earth and in integral ways, um, we've got to expand it from, you know, the 20 percent or the 25 percent that might start with a four year school and finish. Um, there's far greater numbers of people that go into community colleges. And for every single class and semester that we have someone in a two year institution, um, even if they're just going there to get trained, to go straight into the workforce, we, I think we've got an opportunity and a responsibility to expand their horizons a little bit. Um, you know, uh, uh, lifelong learning is something, you know, of course I'm director of continuing education, I really believe that, but I think we've got to shift students and, and, and people and everyone into, into knowing that you don't go to school, then you stop going to school, and then you go and get a job and you start your life. Mm -hmm. uh, things are changing and transforming way too fast. Everything we've learned um, is almost you know, obsolete within a few years after we graduate. And so people will get left behind. And particularly people that don't have complex skills are going to get left behind first. I think you know, a lot of the frustration that, that you know, maybe rural white folks have, you know, stereotypically throughout the Midwest and um, um, in the industri in the in the industri former industrial centers of the states, is unfortunately there's been a resistance to continual training. Mm. Um, the communities that they were in uh, lost a lot of tax dollars when you know they say General Motors pulled up. You know whether we're talking about Youngstown or Flint, you know wherever we are. Mm. So they didn't always have the opportunity to get to get uh, retrained. Um, but there's a lot of resistance to retraining. Because people feel like, you know what, I went to high school, you know, or I might, I got a, I got, you know, I went to community college for a year where I have to go back again. You know, I, I can, I know how to build a car, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately we're not building as many cars and the cars that we built 20 years ago are, are very different than the cars we're building now. And so the, this continuous training and this con continuous education has to be something that everybody's got to be told and drilled into them from the time they graduate from high school. It's just the beginning. It's not the end. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man, that that's very notable to, to, to point out because thinking about thinking about my own educational career, especially from high school, it was this kind of chunk transition from high school, going to college, get the good job. I mean, that's still, kind of the idea of how education is being marketed. And, and even though training is a part of it, it it's it, it's nowhere near, I think, um, marketed or uh, brought to the public in terms of the future that we're moving into as far as the technology that's accelerating in such a way. I mean, when we think about automation, and I've had this conversation with Shelly, and she's yeah. been an incredible person to, to really talk about the, these kinds of things. But when we look at ideas of automation and how rapid automation is happening with technology and replacement of human beings, you know, these conversations that are happening with Ray Kurzweil and some of the other ones to try to prepare countries yeah. for these kinds of shifts that are happening. And where, is it, where does it leave a lot of the population who don't have, you know, those critical thinking skills or who depended on just the outdated skills of like using the example of developing cars or trying to, you know, work in the lines and, and producing something that really is becoming obsolete. 
and how yeah. what do we do about that kind of situation so um yeah that's 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 pretty cool man it, it's cool to, to to think about it's cool to talk about it it's, it's good to hear you know, more people really get involved and thinking of strategies and approaches to resolve the problem um in lieu of all of the the higher kinds of things that are happening right now in politics and still the heavy reliance on the government the government to to make certain changes which you know there's a responsibility there but I'm I'm loving hearing about kind of these grassroots kind of approaches to us taking the responsibility back and saying okay how can we collectively come together bring our intelligence together and bring our concerns and our worries together and really make something that can be a livable situation for all of us and not just livable, but uh, considering all of the complexities and us really moving forward to, to make a future that, that your child and, you know, potentially yeah. other people's children can live in. So that's my, that's my small response slash rant about, yeah. <laughs> about some of those things. Um, as, as I think about, again, children, as I think about the impact that, that children have on voicing their concerns about our planet, and, you know, there's times when you can talk to a child and be really surprised about their awareness, um, about everything that's happening. I mean, it can be a, a simple word as, you know, um, I watched the news and I saw that man say this, or I noticed how these people felt about that situation. You know, that those very simple moments um, can be things that really strike us on the inside and make us realize that these little bodies have a connection to our world in a very unique way that keeps us really mindful about what's going on from, I want to use your term, but probably in a different context, bottom up. <laughs> to think about the youth on up to the older ages and how they're really staying engaged about some of the stuff that's happening. Um, so when we think about your childhood in particular, how, how do you know what you know? Where, where did it start for you? And, and you know, as you've been so involved in many different things, and as you started to share, um, you, you wear many different hats. You know, where where did all of this come from, so to speak? Uh, well, uh, that's a that's always that's a fun question. Um, <laughs> so I grew, you know, I was a typical '70s kid in a lot of ways, and now I was kind of a latchkey kid. You know, my, my, uh, my dad was a police officer, so he was never home, uh, here in DC. And my mom was, was working a lot and had some other things she was focused on. So I spent a lot of time out in the streets and, um, fortunately I got involved in sports early and, uh, I became, uh, just, a you know, a, a soccer addict, uh, soccer and football and track were things that just kind of framed every part of my day or half the day. The other half of my day though, is we had some abandoned railroad tracks, uh, and you know, some, this tree line that went through um, our neighborhood. And so we spent a lot of time in the woods. And so when we're out there playing soccer in the street or playing football on the street, we're after, you know, we're building forts, you know, pretending we're King Arthur, you know, or Douglas, <laughs> Park, um, you know, out in the woods doing things. And um, at a certain point in second or third grade, I started this thing called the Tiger Club. And, uh, you know, we had like these membership thing, you know, everyone had to sign this thing, even though we could really write. But <laughs> I had about 14 or 15 kids that were part of the Tiger Club. And I still run into some of these guys, you know, I say, you remember the Tiger Club, all the stuff we used to do, we used to build spears. And, you know, the, this is during the Vietnam War. And, you know, we used, to, we used to try to, you know, throw rocks at hippies to get them to chase us. So uh, we created like, uh, you know, like, you know, like kind of, a, I don't know, like a little, little gang, you know, of, uh, of elementary school students. But what was interesting, it taught me a lot about people and motivation. Mm -hmm. um, because 
Um, in order to get some of the kids to do stuff, I used to give them medals, you know, really? you know like really? and, um, <laughs> and the hardest stuff that I asked them to do, you know, went from like, they were happy that I just would say, okay, I'm going to give you one medal. And then we didn't even have, I don't even think I ever actually gave out a medal, but then all of a sudden I've, I'd have to say, I'll give you three medals, you know, if you throw a rock at that hippie, you know, and then we got to run, you know, um, you know, or whatever, you know, we, we're going to, all the other stuff we're going to do. And uh, I can remember uh, at one point, I, I'm not even sure I knew how to write it. Um, it's probably in fourth or fifth grade, but I said, I told a kid, I, yeah, I'll give you 10,000 medals um, if you do X. And I can't remember what it was, but I started, um, I started really learning how to, you know, how to work with people. Mm. And uh, fortunately we, we, we gravitated from uh, throwing rocks at hippies, you know, and, and, you know, kind of childish kind of stuff to um, by the time we were in, in junior, in junior high school, we didn't call each other the tiger club anymore, but a lot of us were still hanging out. Uh, we protested against a big highway an interstate highway wow. that they're building uh, in Arlington County, Virginia, where I, where I lived to DC. Mm. And they're going to, they're going to, put this highway or in all these trees that we used to hang out in, you know, this whole railroad line that was like half of our life. And so we put up signs and we, you know, I wrote the governor of Virginia, you know, wrote all the city council members wow. and uh, we, uh, we got involved in it. We also did some, quite frankly, some destruction of the vehicles that they had, you know, we started pulling up engineering stakes so they didn't know what they were doing. And, we got so good, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, statute of limitations is up uh, on this. We would pull up hundreds of engineering stakes, so they, you know, they didn't know where to dig. Uh, they would wow. put them down, you know, with surveyors, spend a couple weeks, and then one night we'd go out there and pull them all up. And uh, our one of our claims to fame is uh, uh, we ended up. Uh, one of the radio stations did a story about this vandalism that was going on with eco uh, eco terrorists. It was the first time that we had, I think I'd ever heard the word terrorist. Wow. <laughs> I remember we had to figure out what it meant because we thought terrorist might be a monster and we said, well, we're not monsters. Um, but uh, anyhow, so um, it was, uh, it was a great way to, it was a great way to sort of grow up and get to know people and then, uh, you know, get involved in some bigger issues and actually have a lot of these politicians and elected officials respond to some of our concerns. I mean, it's going to be an eight lane highway and it was ended up being, uh, you know, a, a six lane um, highway. Mm. Um, and they built, they ended up built as a comp another compromise. Not, it wasn't just us protesting. There's a lot of other people, but built a bicycle lane, which hadn't been planned. And so, as a young person, it gave me some, um, uh, you know, some energy that, you know, that your voice could be heard and it was empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if I ended up going into, you know, uh, political science, you know, when I, when I ended up uh, finally getting to college. But um, I think the other thing about my childhood um, is I had a couple of epiphanies um, that were the first sense that I had any sort of spiritual um, context to my life. Mm. Um, and they're, you know, they kind of, they don't sound like much, but, uh, I was bouncing a basketball in third grade over and over again on the playground when I was at school. And I think I was doing it for like a minute or two. I think I went into some kind of trance, but I had this, uh, overwhelming feeling that, uh, I had self-consciousness mm. and I went from being like this mindless kid to um, while I'm bouncing this basketball that I was a third grader, that I was in Mrs. King's class, that this was a lot of fun and I should enjoy it because I'm not going to be a kid uh, for the rest of my life. And um, I had this incredible sense of self-awareness um, mm. from that point on, you know, and you know, it was uh I knew I was a kid all of a sudden before I was just kind of gliding through life and I was just doing what I was doing. But, um, something changed where I sort of had another perspective where I, I could actually see myself as well as be myself, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, it was then, uh, 
when I, in my teenage years, you know, maybe they're hormonal, you know, you know, peaks or something, you know, but I had a, a couple other experiences. I used to deliver newspapers, you know, and there was one time I had this, like, almost felt like being electrocuted and I fell back against this car and, um, dropped my newspapers I was carrying and, uh, everything kind of washed through my vision and I, it's really white light. And uh, the thing, the thing, and I've written poetry about this, and I've drawn a couple pictures of it, but the only way I can describe it is that I saw and had uh, a deep feeling that everything was connected and nothing was separated. Mm. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a profound thing to sort of, have fragmentation cease in my life. And even if I couldn't make the connection sort of rationally or intellectually, I knew there was some connection. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, again, it was a profound, you know, thing, kind of simple, but, you know, and probably maybe a lot of people go through that and experience it. But for me, it, uh, uh, it helped, it, it changed the way I was living, you know, and being, you know, um, as a kid and as a teenager. Take, take me back to this comment of see myself to be myself. What, what did that mean for you at eight years old or however old you were whenever you had that experience? I was, you know, I think, you know, before that I was just kind of mindless. You know, I'd get up in the morning, you know, put my clothes on, you know, go to school, you know, play with my friends. And uh, from that uh, moment on the playground, um, I was very completely self-conscious mm. as if I was as almost as if I was an adult in an eight year old body. Mm -hmm. I knew I was a kid. Now, I mean, I didn't have the knowledge and I didn't have the, you know, the capacities that adult had, but there was a, a part of me that was very clear that um, kind of maybe I was uh, I was a kid in this vessel that was going to mature and change. Mm -hmm. And, um, appreciate it because it's not going to always be like that. And um, I don't know if I, if I was going through some problems or something, but I, think I was always pretty happy go lucky kid. But again, one of the, the, the overpowering feeling was um, um, get as much as you can, you know, get a lot of experiences, you know, go out, you know, be in the world, you know, have fun with your friends, you know, do the tiger club and all that. And just really, you know, enjoy that. Wow. So when I think about the experiences that you've shared, you know, like the basketball situation, and then whenever you are preparing to deliver newspapers, um, was there ever a moment where the current religion of the day, where that became a a place where you want to seek out maybe what that was or, or had it always been this very sounds like organic experience without the mm -hmm. trying to put on things to try to understand it and trying to attach yourself to um, different denominational beliefs, religious beliefs to try to, to gain more understanding. Was there ever a point where you reached out for that or, or did that experience, did those experiences just turn on their own, so to speak? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, my, my parents were uh, agnostics, but they made me and my brother go to Sunday school. <laughs> yeah. A real conservative, strict one, you know, and they'd combine, pick us up on the bus. Yeah, you know, I and, remember uh, those. Yeah, so... Um, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't a consistent goer because I always had soccer games on Sunday, but if I had a, an afternoon game, you know, once or twice a month, you know, my parents would make me go, you know, to church and you know, I kind of took it, you know, I, you know, I, I took it for what it was, you know, I wasn't terribly, you know, involved in it, but uh, when I, uh, in junior high school, they're always doing like trips for the kids, you know, like going to the, you know, King's Dominion or going skiing. And I never did any of that. And so I finally decided that, you know, I liked a couple of the kids in the class, particularly a, a girl that was in the class. And uh, we were going to go to amusement park. And um, 
again, my dad was a cop, you know, they didn't make any that much money back then. And my mom wasn't working. And, uh, uh, I was going to go, you know, I was, I just started delivering newspapers so I could actually pay the small fee that we had to do. But, uh, the week before we were supposed to go, um, the youth minister said that, um, you know, what we were supposed to wear. And, uh, you know, and he said, we had to have sock, we had to have shorts that went down a certain amount of inches to our, down our, you know, to our knee. And this was in the 1970s, you know, where everyone wearing those really high shorts. Right. And <laughs> the only shorts I owned was soccer shorts. Wow. You know, and these things, you know, were, you know, barely bigger than bikinis in a lot of ways. And I was really embarrassed. And um, I decided not to go on this trip um, because um, I, was, I didn't, I didn't have, I guess I hadn't collected any money yet from the paper out. And I was, kind of embarrassed going through being a teenager, even asking my parents for like money to have longer shorts, which I also knew I wouldn't wear because I just, I wore soccer clothes like all day long. Mm -hmm. um, but the realization that it gave me was that, wow, I, I thought to myself, I can't believe God would think about the shorts that somebody was wearing. Yeah. And um, I never, uh, you know, from that point on, I distanced myself from, uh, Christianity um, from any major religion, because I, I really felt like uh, uh, people made up a lot of rules, and that of course God doesn't care about you know the shorts you wear and and all that. And it was a uh, it was another one of these you know profound teenage you know experiences. But it, you know, again, it left um, you know it, it left something on me, and it's it's made it a little harder for me since then because I've got this mistrust of organized religion, you know, so I've never, you know, I, I practice a lot of Buddhist inspired um, practices and, you know, you know, and, you know, read a whole lot of Asian, you know, Hindu um, literature. And I know that, you know, in a, in a lot of respects, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the best trend, the most effective transference is to work with someone real closely, a guru, uh, you know, to guide you through a lot of that. And it's been really hard for me to uh, go far with a, with a lot of that because just deep down, um, I feel like uh, spirituality is experiential and um, it's more comfortable for me and doesn't uh, create a lot of shadows rising in me, uh, you know, by taking classes, you know, by maybe, you know, going to, uh, you know, meditation circles where we have dialogues and we can learn in groups. Uh, but one-on-one -on -one, uh, where someone's supposed to tell, tell me how I think and translate the things that I'm feeling and thinking, it's been very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. So taking that last part into consideration, what, what does spirituality mean to you? Um, well, it means creativity to me. Um, it's just pure, incredible energy and creativity, and it arises in each moment. Mm. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, talking about spirituality uh, in any type of way is, uh, is, is complicated because you have to first talk with people about what you mean by spirituality. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the, kind of the general sense of, of, what you're, of what you're asking. For me, it's creativity. And... Um, uh, one of the ways that I interpret my own spirituality as I try to learn and, and grow and adapt is um, poetry was really important to me uh, growing up and to this day. Uh, so Walt Whitman gave me uh, a way to understand deep spirituality, um, you know, in almost a, a picturesque way. I mean, I would read the poetries and I would see pictures, I would see paintings, I would see wow. pictures, I would see images. And uh, uh, later on, when I was in my 20s, then I encountered Ken Wilber. And his, uh, his first, the first book I read of his was Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality that came out in, I think, 95. And that book gave me a language, gave me the words mm. to interpret these pictures that I would see in my mind that Whitman helped me. Mm. And so between the two of them, uh, you know, if I have a, a particular teacher or guru or mentor, 
um, it would be these two virtual teachers, you know, mm -hmm. Walt Whitman and Ken Wilber. Mm -hmm. um, they've helped me. They've helped me translate the things that I feel and sense deeply. Wow. You know, you triggered a thought when you just talked about having language to communicate the experiences. At least I'm going to summarize it into my own words. Having the language to communicate the experiences that maybe others can relate or maybe it, maybe not. You know, we think about the circle of people you may be around. And I remember seeing a blog that you posted about, um, I think it was business in general, that we just need a shift in language and we, and we really need to reconsider developing new language to describe some of these things. I, I, I may not um, say it verbatim or at least the way that you, you blogged it, but I, am I at least in the ballpark? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're going to have transformation, you can't use old words because the words are just concepts, you know, they're, they're images. And so if we're really going to have, we're going to talk about personal or community transformation, you've got to have, you've got to adapt to new words. Otherwise you just have reform. Mm. The big distinction between reform and transform. Uh, reforming is basically based on best practices and you're kind of, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic mm. uh, transformation. You're creating something completely new um, for the moment, you know, for that emerge, you know, for that emerging situation that's, you know, that's, that's happening right now. It, you know, just listening to this, I'm, I'm just making a mental connection to something you talked about earlier, whenever you all were um, having the bottom up meetings to, transform the community I um, mean you were talking about bringing in the locals and bringing in starting with the bottom up kind of uh, approach um, did you were you conscious and intentional about developing new language during those kinds of meetings um, or was that something that just you know as as those meetings happened you kind of snapshot and and, and gathered certain words that just seemed to fit the context at that moment. Um, were, you, were you doing some of these things even during these kind of development? Yeah, when I first started doing, uh, you know, we had the, the, the strategic planning process we called uh, the Citizen Summit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, I didn't use new words. Mm -hmm. um, um, what I, the, the new vocabulary uh, sensitivity that I have is, is probably three or four years old. Mm. Um, and it's been, it's been seated, it's been seated into me, into my thinking a little bit, uh, partly by my co-author Rick Smyer, mm. but also uh, reading a little bit more about semiotics and understanding how mm. words get in us and in, kind of uh, infect us a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, for good and bad. Um, I went to, uh, I've gone to India a couple times in the last few years and uh, Chris Benorthy is a, is a, is a powerful um, influencer in my thinking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his thoughts are based on conditioning uh -huh. and words, uh, words are the first and greatest conditioning tool or, veil or framework that, um, uh, you know, gets laid on us. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the context of a word is so incorporated in your culture in your, you know, your community ethics and your, you know, your, your, you know, your, your, your norms as a family, um, that, um, the old words um, aren't going to get you to new places, you know, because they're contextual, they're, con you, know, you know, they're, they're full of conditions, you know, you, you, you know, you can, you can barely, in fact, I, I tried this, you know, when I was giving this uh, talk uh, to this fo these folks on Capitol Hill, you know, I said that, you know, you know, the, this, you know, the, the ceiling is blue in this room. We can certainly all agree with that. And, um, and, 
people said, half the people in the room, the people in the front said, no, it's actually brown. What I hadn't noticed was the back of the room, uh, you know, the, where I could see the ceiling was blue, but in the, in the front of the room wow. where people were sitting it was brown because I hadn't looked directly above my head. I was looking, you know, out into the, you know, the back of the back of the audience. Wow. wow. And um, so just something as simple as that, you've got to be really careful about the assumptions that you make when you talk. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, again, words, um, new words, um, I'm convinced are, are critical for transformation. Wow. You know, it, it, as a side note, I guess, um, the last couple of weeks I've been having to come back to the, the notion of words and communicating from a space where there's clarity and where there's, I'm going to say pristineness, but I'm, I'm going to use it in, in a way um, to say that for me, there's, there's this space that I've been having to really be aware of that trans, transparency has been at the forefront and being able to, trans, to communicate what I sense and to communicate it in a way that also integrates a language. Because when I'm thinking about right now, this space is more an intra communication. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of old words and a lot of a lot of experiences that have not been quote unquote labeled, so to speak. And they and mm -hmm. I, I get this sense that there's this emergence of language and there's this emergence of of words that need to be associated with this space. And so in some way, I don't know how, but I'm making this connection with what you just shared about just language and just moving into a space where we can have these, not just new experiences, but really engage from a personal level all the way out. We can engage in a way that gives us this new direction and gives us this new space that we all as a human race and even what some others say, the others that we all sense that there's this shift in this direction that we need to move forward. Um, for what I was out, for whatever it's worth, I felt the need to just share that, man, uh, because I, I, I'm connected and I'm bobbing with. I'm with you. Like, I'm with you. <laughs> so tell me, when you think about what Neil has learned over the course of this part of your life, if you can think about maybe two or three things that have really carried you up to this point, and, and not just you, but what you feel that if you run into the person at the grocery store and there, you, know, you have that moment where you, you feel a connection or you have that brief moment in the hallway with a student or after class or, or what have you, what are those few things that you sense that have carried you and have also been beneficial when you've shared them with others? Wow. Um, well, the, the, definitely the over, the overriding uh, thing, uh, you know, is spawned from that, uh, that epiphany I had delivering my newspapers is that uh, we are all connected and all things are connected. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, uh, for me, it's an incredible faith that I have um, that there's an access point to every human being for every single thing that I uh, uh, have access to. Mm. Um, you know, we're just not independent of anything else. Um, you know, we're part of, uh, you know, I definitely see the world as, a, as, a, as an organic biological system. Um, you know, I, I think my parents' world, you know, and certainly my dad's world, you know, it's kind of, uh, he was very regimented, you know, and his world was based kind of on physics, you know, where everything's predictable. And, you know, you got up in the morning, you did the same thing every day, you got in your routine, and that was your, you know, that, that's what put you in control. Wow. Um, for me, it's completely different where um, I gave up a sense of control a long time ago. Um, the, the world's always been somewhat seemingly to me unpredictable. And, um, 
what's been helpful is in all the unpredictable unpredictability of this world, knowing that there are sort of some connective, that we're all connected and it's not, it's not disconnected and chaotic in a bad term. And when I use chaos, it's usually good because I think chaos is part of emergence. But um, what would be frightening, you know, is like what an existentialist, you know, with, you know, Sartre and the rest of them might, might, you know, say it's like, they basically felt we were all disconnected, you know, we're all by ourselves and, you know, we're probably we're not connected to any deep uh, thing. That to me would be frightening. You know, mm. Kierkegaard, you know uh, his whole, you know, his whole philosophy was based on, you know, was it worth, you know, was it worth living? You know, should you jump over the edge? And um, <laughs> for me, it'd be frightening. And if I hadn't had those uh, experiences, you know, uh, for me, I had a sense of meaning. So the sense of connection and interconnection uh, is, you know, that I would want to impart on somebody that I met in a grocery store um, uh, would be the, the two things. And then maybe the, the last part, and again, it's all connected. I mean, everything I talk, everything I'm, I'm a part of is kind of connected. Um, is, and it kind of goes back to words, you know, that we were just talking about is um, with the beginning of words is fragmentation. Words divide things up so we can understand them. You know, there are concepts so that we can understand each other and make a sentence. But it, to, to me, because of the multiple, multiple ways we can understand words, that's the beginning of fragmentation. And the way that I get to unity and connectivity, particularly for complex things, is through silence and through meditation. And that's the power for me because words are conditioned uh, to a degree, to a great degree, particularly on complex ideas. Um, it's only in silence. It's only, you know, in, in meditation when words disappear, that fragmentation ceases. Mm, mm. Uh, and so that would probably be, um, you know, that's, that's probably, you know, the, maybe the third bullet, you know, the third point, um, wow. to walk around with. I love that, man. I love it. Love it, man. It's like a cool glass of water on a summer's day, hot summer's day. That's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Well, you know, the, the show, the interview is titled Old Souls, man. And so I, I, I can't let you get away without at least dropping some knowledge on this one. What is an old soul? And I could probably answer this next question, but it's a two-part question. What's an old soul and have you ever been referred to as an old soul? Uh, yes, I've been referred to as an old soul. Uh, you know, I've been walking around like, uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. So I've been walking around with that for the last day, you know, day or two, uh, thinking about that. So, um, old, you know, old is relative because it's time, you know? Sure. And, um, so in, in one sense, uh, Time, the way I think about time is, is just now, you know, there isn't, it isn't necessarily linear and longitudinal where it goes back. I mean, there, there's certainly, there's a, there's a growing up aspect and I think an integral, you know, we call it growing up, you know, and there is that, that sense of time. Um, but when I really think of, as I, as I did my walks around the, the block uh, last night, um, thinking about this, Old soul really means to me uh, deep and depth. You're almost like blockchain. You know, it's like one bit of information uh, or, you know, knowledge connection put on top of each other rather than longitude, you know, going by longitude, it's actually depth. Mm. And um, that to me is um, an old soul. Uh, that depth is to me is com complexity. Things that are complex are deeper rather than wider. Um, so um, that's uh, what I that's that's what I connect with, you know. And the you know again, you know, on this on this longitude aspect of time, you know, it's you know it's based on memory, you know, and again, and it's based on narrative, and we're all taught that, you know, the American Civil War happened because of a certain reason, you know, and you talk to 20 people and you get, 
you know, 10 different reasons probably. <laughs> and um, I think that's related to everything, you know, when we're talking about words, when we're talking about, you know, the nature of time. So it's really depth and complexity um, that I get. Uh, and so an, an old soul is somebody who is existing very deeply with a lot of maturity in the here and now experiencing emergence as it is getting ready to uh, burst forth. Wow. Wow. You know, as you were speaking, I, I reflected back on my interview with Constantina and somehow, some way reincarnation came up in the conversation and uh, she shared a, a different kind of light that I've, I've never heard before about the research regarding cellular memory. And um, she said that she wasn't quite sure about reincarnation, but the interesting things about cellular memory and the possibilities of what we call reincarnations having some connection with our biological makeup and the information that's passed down biologically and how much of that do we retain um, that has come from grandparents and, and great, 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 great parents and all these kind of things that's being channeled in. And then of course you think about, you know, the conversation of the morphic field and the bigger consciousness and how we're connected to it. And, you know, that brings in some very interesting dynamics mm -hmm. as well, but, I love I love the depth. I love the, the the imagery of the depth and not so much here and the linear here, but just the, the content of depth, man. That's that's awesome. Is there anything else you want to say about your your book, man, or just the body of work that you've done? I know that you've again you you do blogs, you you stay pretty in involved in terms of social media and um obviously what you're doing with the campuses and you're doing your lectures and you're continuing to promote your book. Is there anything else you'd like to share about your book? Um, you know, just, you know, like every other uh, incredible thing in my life, it, it's, it's been a, a sense of connection, you know, where, and I think I was saying this earlier, maybe before we actually started recording, but it's, it's, helped me connect to different people that obviously I didn't know. I'm meeting all kinds of people who are sending me emails and um, not only creating a, a new relationship, but they're helping me understand, you know, my book, you know, and the words that I wrote, you know, in a way that I hadn't quite frankly thought of, you know, and um, they, you know, I don't know if they're blind spots, but they've added, you know, depth to the book. So um, uh, the, the, the book, while it was co-written by Rick Smyer and I, um, there's probably been, you know, I, we, we list about 300 people in the beginning of the book who have all been involved in our thinking over the last 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could not have been created. It wouldn't look like what it did without all these people involved. And many of them are still involved with the work. And, uh, we, you know, we were at, you know, we, we were at a fantastic conference on uh, next generation entrepreneurship and how ecosystems are developed and, and integral, quite frankly, with one of the framing contexts as well as, wow. as, well as my book. Um, and it keeps the book and the ideas are delivering me, you know, to ways uh, and places uh, and to people that I, you know, I had, hadn't imagined um, I would ever come into um, connection with. So I'm doing that, you know, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing. Um, you know, my, my publisher wants to publish uh, 10 books in the context of this book. And so wow. people that are part of the Communities of the Future Network, which everybody's you know, open to become part of, and um, we've got a Facebook group, and we've got a website and all that, um, they're looking for good ideas. And so I'm doing a lot of um, framing and editing and, you know, adding chapters uh, or we'll, you know, we'll be doing all that. Um, there, a lot of them are, they're coming together now, uh, the next three or four. Um, so I'm looking for more people walking around, you know, with kind of an integral mindset, you know, in my book, we call it a second enlightenment, um, you know, but I, I call it either that or an integral age, you know, but I think we're entered in, entering into this 
new age that's going to emerge over the last over the next uh, 10, 20 years, um, which is going to be incredible. You know, we get to you know we're going to you know, multiple people hitting that teal level. You know, we're thinking about you know the the, the integral um, framework, and that's going to to me that's going to pull up. Uh, you know, it's going to create a lot of movement where greens are going to evolve and yellows are going to evolve and um, all the people at different levels of consciousness are going to be moved forward. The, of course, the challenge is going to be the next 10 or 20 years, you know, and this is, you know, we've got size the environment, you know, which we, you know, hopefully we're not going to go over the tipping point of destruction, um, which we very well could. Um, I think that our, because our political systems and our social systems and our religious systems are going to uh, uh, collapse uh, and hopefully they'll evolve and, and into something new. But any one of these major um, sectors of, of, of the human psyche, if they don't come back in a whole way, uh, we're not going to make it through 20 years. You know, mm. we have to have a new religion. We have to have government that's more responsive, that's dynamic, that's not mm. based on ideas that are t 250 years old. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not going to make it, you know, and um, I feel like there's more and more people that are becoming involved in, you know, these types of ideas, you know, and integral ideas and growth and becoming more sensitive and they, they know that something's wrong and you sort of, you put out, you know, um, some ideas and people connect to it, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, uh, so I feel, I feel really hopeful that the next 20 years are going to be, you know, pretty rocky, I think. Wow. Um, on that note, th th that those comments deserve a, a, a second interview, man, a second, third interview. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, that, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. And there's, there's some things I, I strongly resonate with. Um, but so that, that I respect your time and I don't fall asleep on you, which I'm now I'm like, I'm up. Like the conversation is, is really invigorated me, man. Um, well, I, I think you've touched on just some of the new projects that you have coming out. And so that's, that's really, um, that's great to hear, but more than great, man. It, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that really gives me expectation because as you are talking about these it sounds like extensions that are happening from the chapters of the book and from some of the conversations um, that you've been in. It sounds like there's just multiple things that are happening uh, from the book or being inspired from the book. And so that's great to hear. When you, when you think about like your blogging and when you're out doing promotions, maybe for your book or you're doing lectures, um, is there some kind of, like feed people can just go to? Is there some kind of website that people can go to to access these kinds of meal moments? Yeah, uh, definitely. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I have a, I have a website, uh, Emergent Action. If you Google Emergent Action, it will come up, but it's www.emergentaction, all one word, dot com. And uh, I have the same thing. I have a Twitter account, you know, uh, Neil Richardson at, emergent action. And um, if you contact me um, and uh, anyone who's interested in uh, futurism in particular and community transformation, we've, uh, you know, this Communities of the Future Network um, is a really could be a fantastic resource for people. And if you Google Communities of the Future, um, there's several different websites come up. It's better for me to just directly um, connect you to it. We've got a Facebook group we're all um, connecting on, and that's COTF 2.0. And um, uh, that's where we, you know, we all, we, we come together and we share our ideas. And um, the idea of the Communities of the Future Network is, is an open source. Um, we're one collective brain. And, uh, you know, again, there's probably been three or 400 people that have, that have been with us over the years. Um, there's probably about 100 um, who are with us monthly. Um, you're working on different projects. And then there's 40, you know, Uber 
uh, members who are doing things constantly. You know, we're always, you know, checking in on each other's work and uh, adding layers to it, adding complexity to it. And we invite everybody to be involved in that. There's no, uh, you know, if, as long as you ascribe to the, to the integral ideas and the ideas that, you know, we've laid out in the book, um, you know, which um, anybody listening to this blog uh, automatically gets a, you know, a free pass, um, you know, we'd love to have you. Nice, nice. Neil, can you give me the website one more time? Because I'll put these in a caption once I upload uh, the videos. So what's your personal website again? Yep. www.emergentaction.com. Okay. www.emergentaction.com. All right. And you said that your were you giving out your Twitter account as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's Neil Richardson. I think it's all one word. At emergent action. Okay. All right. Excellent. In the Facebook, I have C O T F two point O. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Any final words, Neil? Man, this has been fun. Um, you know, we, you know, when you do things like this, you know, it, I'm somewhat reactive, you know, because I'm at you're asking me questions. You know, so I feel like there's a million things I wanted to ask you about, you know, so we'd have a, you know, we could have really a dialogue. I don't know if that's going to be entertaining for a lot of people, but there's a million things that I would love to actually be in, like sort of a, you know, a Bohemian dialogue, you know, if you will. Um, with you so hope you know hopefully we'll be able to do that you know either on your on this format you know or over coffee or beers or tea um at some point i mean absolutely um yeah let's just plan it i mean once i end this recording let's just plan it man I, i'd love i'd love that i'd love just to get my thoughts out uh to hear your thoughts about my thoughts and just yeah the dialogue thing man i i, I would love to have that with you man because again um, I just resonate with a lot of things that you've, you've posted. Uh, your your post and response, man, they give me life, man. I read through them, and it gives me things to really just sit and think about. And, um, yeah, man, I, I love it. So, yeah, I would love to do that. So if, cool. if there's no final words, man, that you have to share with the audience, man, um, I'll – well, let me first – give you the space to, to share if there's anything else you'd like to. You know, the thing that's coming to mind, there's a Whitman quote that I've, I've, I've painted on my wall in my dining room. Um, it's only themselves know themselves and the like of themselves as souls only know souls. Mm. And uh, I think we can see each other. Um, I think what it means is we can uh, see into each other's souls, you know, so that's what's coming to mind. Mm. Only themselves know themselves and the like of themselves as souls only know souls. Mm. Yeah, that deserves to, to, to be set with for a few seconds or a few moments. That's good. I'm going to meditate on that. How about that? <laughs> Well, man, Neil, it has been an absolute pleasure um, this last hour and a half just being able to hear from you and um, you just share, man. It, it, it's it's great. I really appreciate it. And again, I hope we definitely can do this again. And i um, looking forward to the class that's being developed around your book. I haven't followed up with my sister if she's read the book yet, but when I get back to the States, I'm looking forward to thumbing through the pages, man, and diving in. So, um, Excellent. Cool. Thank you, sir. I'm going to stop the recording now, and, and we can right. play our next, our next moment. All right. All right.